a podcast to honor the gods. This better come with a sacrifice. Dave X Media. The dream changed. His body felt smooth, powerful, and flexible. He was guiding between shining metal bars across dark, cold stone. He was flat against the floor, sliding along on his belly. It was dark, yet he could see objects around him shimmering in strange, vibrant colors. He was turning his head. At first glance, the corridor was empty. But no. A man was sitting on the floor ahead, his chin drooping onto his chest, his outline gleaming in the dark. Welcome to the Restricted section, where me and my friends get super high and talk about Harry fucking Potter. If you haven't done the reading, don't worry, we did it for you. Here's what we're talking about this week. Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, Chapter 21, The Eye of the Snake. This is also a big miscellaneous chapter. A lot of these chapters have been just like miscellaneous. Uh, Hagrid's back in action. And Umbridge comes to evaluate his class, and it does not go well. Oh, my God. Harry gets, like, a big smooch from Cho, I guess. <laughs> we don't really get to see it, but uh, this doesn't lead to wet dreams, unfortunately. Um, it leads to worse dreams than that. Um, Harry dreams that he is viciously murdering Arthur Weasley as a snake. So that's fun. <laughs> Matt, you're experiencing some issues that I know. are funny to look at. You, can you see it too? Yeah. Matt, you you look like a futuristic cyborg is trying to hack into the Zoom screen to warn us about like what's about to happen. Matt, I watched Zoolander a couple days ago and that long scene where Will Ferrell is like um, brainwashing Derek Zoolander by using like weird clips of himself dressed up as like Little Bo Peep and stuff. That's what you look like right now. I should dress up like Little Bo Peep is what I'm hearing. <laughs> <laughs> Message received. <laughs> Wait, what? Literally, what is happening to you? I don't. It's been doing this ever since I got on the call. Uh, that's weird. <laughs> would, would you care to, like, leave and attempt to come back and see if it's better? I could do that, yeah. Let me try. Don't don't stop recording, though. <laughs> no, leave this in. This is comedy gold. It's comedy gold. <laughs> Everyone loves a good visual do- joke told verbally. <laughs> An audio medium. <laughs> I was literally like, I don't know if this is just me, but his audio is coming through fine, so I guess I can just, <laughs> like, deal with it, you know? I was going to just deal with it until I tried counting, and it was too visually distracting for me to count to five. And okay. I was like, we got to do something about this. Fair. <laughs> hey, how's it going? Hi, how are you? It's great oh to god, see you. Oh my god, you're so normal. Nope. Oh my god, you're like oh, the nope. normalist. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I told you it's been a week. <laughs> Oh I want goodness. everyone to understand, <laughs> I guess, because I guess I'm leaving this in as context, because it's not like we're not going to mention it. <laughs> <laughs> I want everyone to understand how whack <laughs> Matt's screen looks right now. It's crazy. It's like I don't. I'm not seeing any movement from him. It's like stop motion, you know, yeah. like like flat. It's like we're looking back through photographs. And occasionally there's two Brooks right now. Sometimes there's two me's in the background, like we're haunting you. <laughs> yep. I'm black and white for whatever reason. Yeah, there there I go. <laughs> Wait, is that the direction you... That's the direction you guys see my bangs in? Correct. Wait, is that right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's so weird. That's um, great. Matt, who, who signed the Wicked poster behind you? Um, That would be... The, ca- the Broadway cast as of 2009. Nice. It was part of the, you know, That's every cool. couple of years Broadway does um, Equity Fights AIDS, where you give money, you can yep. get some cool stuff. And so this was one of the things they did that year. I saw nice. Wicked for the first time a couple of months ago. That shit was so good. It's a very good show. It's beautiful. 
Anyway, okay, welcome to the restricted section, uh, where we have the range of an emotional little teaspoon. You Am have I starting the strong? The I emotional said it wrong. Range. Wait, hold on. You have the emotional range? <laughs> we are emotional teaspoon. I am an emotional teaspoon. Not a tablespoon. Teaspoons, baby. <laughs> I'm feeling things about being filled with baking powder, with salt. <laughs> uh-huh. Except I, you would never use a full teaspoon of salt in your cooking. <laughs> yeah, that's a pincheroo. Um... <laughs> When I hear the phrase emotional teaspoon, I think of, I used to have this set of ceramic spoon measures that were shaped like cats. Adorable. But they were also ceramic, so they all broke in my drawer. That's and nice. that was an emotional teaspoon situation. <laughs> well done. Anyway, my co-host today is full of Nargles. Brooke, say hello <laughs> to the listeners, Brooke. Hi, I am Nargleified. Nargle gargling over here. <laughs> That sounds like a very bad dance we would have done in middle school. Oh, guys, I only get to talk to adults for like five minutes a day on average now. So (laughs) I have gone a little off. Uh, Well, this is not going to be that for you. So sorry, Um, (laughs) but there's no need to pretend with us. Um, Our special guest today is our friend Matt Barger. Say hello to the listeners, Matt. Hello, Brooke has sent the Nargles to attack my Zoom stream. Oh, yeah. The Zoom is, well, let's just say that the Zoom call is doing a little bit of a remix with Matt's visual input right now. I'm doing a dance. It's um, it's a remix. You remember the Flurp is a Madman Help Us Save Us video? <gasps> Flurp is a Madman Help Us Save Us! Flurp is a Madman Help Us Save Us! Oh, my God. I know every single word of that movie when I was a kid and I was trying to go to sleep. I would close my eyes and just like watch the movie in my brain. Spy Kids yeah. specifically. It's a heavily Spy Kids video situation at present. Oh, my God. It's like so kooky and definitely bad, but not scary because it's for children. You're recording. You need to clip a little bit of this visual and just, just post, post it on this. our Instagram for this. context. <laughs> Matt, do you consent? Because I am recording. Yes, please post it. This is hysterical. Okay, okay, good. Um, Brooke, I recently started watching a new TV show that I'm enjoying a lot called Owl House, and you have the exact hair right now of one of the main characters, Amity. Ooh, I like the yes. name Amity, actually. Yes, it's ironic in the beginning because she's not a very good friend, but something tells me that she's having a bit of an arc right now. I mean, to be fair, am I a good friend? (laughs) No, but you're not named Amity, but you're also not a babbling brook, so. (laughs) Matt, how have you been since the last, well, the last time I saw you was like a week and a half ago, but the last time the listeners saw you was a while ago. So how have you been since whenever that was? It's good. It's been, what, about a year or so? Probably. Um, yes. Oh, my God. That's actually so funny because the last time you were on the podcast was uh, January 26th. So it's like 51 weeks ago. We're doing a great job of nailing that timing. So what chapter was that? Chapter 22 of Goblet of Fire. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And okay. what happens in that chapter? Fuck all. <laughs> that's the chapter where, where the boys are trying to get dates. The boys have to ask girls out and they don't know how to do it because... They're emotionally unintelligent. Much like this chapter, emotionally unintelligent. Well, this is the perfect follow-up. So the funny thing is, listeners, is actually, like, Matt is supposed to be my co-host, but he pretty early on expressed interest in only coming on for the romantic scenes. So (laughs) that's what we agreed on, is um, he's only going to be here when things are steaming up a little bit. So I guess here we are, just thinking of the scene as it is in the book, the phrase steaming up just could not be, maybe behind the glasses because of the tears, I don't know. We're in for some real wet kissing. We're in for some fade to black on a first peck, you know, like. (laughs) It's so overly dramatically written as well. It's just, it's so. When I was however old when this came out, this was shocking. Same. This was sexy. (laughs) I did not read this until several years after it came out because I was four. Mm. Okay, brag. (laughs) Oof. All right, that doesn't. It doesn't cause any emotional teaspoons for me. So. <laughs> We've got a wide wide range here. Brooke has a child and I have 
nothing. A weird Zoom thing. That's what you have. Right? I'm giving you. I'm giving you a fun dance. <laughs> He's like still. He really is like still dancing. It's like the breakdown of a music video where the rap is like, oh, 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 and, and like it goes all crazy. But like in the music video, it's like just a split second because otherwise it'll give you, it'll like trigger people with epilepsy. <laughs> you honestly might have to put a trigger warning when you oh, post this raise video the just roof it's made flashing, me yeah. it's flashing so much. You need to get that looked at. <laughs> oh, he's raving. Now. He's raving. <laughs> I'm giving. I'm giving you multiple options for what you want to clip. See, people act like technical issues are this big problem when, in reality, they're sometimes the greatest source of joy. Do y'all remember that when Haley's audio sometimes gets so weird and matrixy and it's like the funniest thing because she yep. gets madder and madder, yep. but her voice is still a robot voice? Yep. Yep. <laughs> Honestly, I want a remix of this to like uh like levels by Avicii as an Instagram <laughs> reel, just different clips of it. Ooh. I was about to just, I, I've trained myself because, you know, I smoke and I drink during these recordings. So I've trained myself pretty well to be, when my brain is like, what next? Eyes go to the notes. I just start reading whatever's next. So I was about to just say the next day, Hermione, because that's like how my notes start <laughs> without any preamble. Yep. <laughs> but let's get into it. Today we're here to talk about Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, chapter 21, The Eye of the Snake, wink. Wonder what no. that means. No, wait, no, I don't want to wink on that. <laughs> Isn't that a euphemism for yes. penis? It's a okay. euphemism it for pee hole. Absolutely a euphemism for your dick hole. Pee hole. Okay. Dick holes are so funny. You can like blink them. Yeah. I think it's called winking. <laughs> Is that a thing? It winking, surely must wink. be called winking because it's only one. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's why. It's got to be. Can't argue with hard logic. <laughs> oh boy. Uh anyway, um, <laughs> so last chapter we got Hagrid's tail uh late one night. <laughs> you know, the appropriate time to hang out with your students. Alone in your house. The next day, Hermione goes back down to Hagrid's while the boys are doing homework. She's trying to like, I don't know, save him from himself. <sighs> Here's the thing. Hermione values education so much, and yet she's standing up for, like, a clearly incompetent teacher. Like, I get that we like Hagrid. They like Hagrid. I don't like Hagrid. Don't but, like Hagrid. Like, you would think that Hermione, of all people, would be like, actually, dude, maybe you should take a step back. Professor Grubbly Plank's kind of where it's at. Honestly, that is a really good angle, because... What I don't think Hermione would do is, like, let him fail because, like, Umbridge could kind of do anything Yeah, she wanted to him. But you're right that, like, he could just be the groundskeeper, which is, like, you know, a, a fitting job for someone like him to someone like Umbridge. You know what I mean? It's what he was for decades prior. Yeah, just, like, stay out of the castle. Like, don't draw attention to yourself. Well, I mean, you can come, you can go into the castle. I'm just saying, like, you're not, he's not a good teacher. He's and like teacher. Harry mentions it multiple times in this chapter where it's like people are making fun of him and Harry's like, I want to stand up for you, but they've got a point, man. They've got a point. <laughs> yeah. Hermione even says that, you know, when she gets back and she basically says that she, she can't count the number of times she told Hagrid, follow what Grubbly Plank was going to do because that's how you're going to A, teach us, but also B, keep your job. It's also just like, I don't know. Even what? Okay. What formal training does Hagrid have in being a teacher? None. So like, why not just com completely outside of the umbrage issue? Like, why not look at what this more experienced older teacher has like prepared and like take note of it? Use the materials that exist. His training is assumed to be by osmosis. He's been around teachers and therefore he is now a teacher. Well, you know what, Brooke? I've been listening to the back catalog of Hey Riddle Riddle. You know, winter depressos. Um, yep. I'm like, I need to LOL. I think I'm funnier because of it. I think I'm literally <laughs> funnier right now than I usually am because I've been listening to Hey Riddle Riddle. 
You can so. osmos a surprising number of skills. I think an entire lesson plan is not a thing you can suck into yourself like Kirby and then spit back out. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I think I, I think we mentioned Kirby. You made a last Kirby reference too. last episode, yeah. <laughs> you did. I don't remember Amazing. what it was, but I very clearly remember it. I remember what it was because <laughs> I said it and no one laughed, and then I stopped the entire podcast and said, Did you hear my joke about Kirby? I'm pretty sure I edited that out. <laughs> you did, which There's is a, a shame. Peek behind the curtain. <laughs> but I I said that Umbridge was dressed like Kirby. Fair. Which is disrespectful as fuck to Kirby, but we won't go into that. Well, and it's funny because Kirby is always dressed like everyone else. Kirby is my favorite in Super Smash Bros. I I went as Kirby every time. Because he was super overpowered. <laughs> Are you into video games at all, Brooke? <laughs> no. Are we doing that for the listeners? <laughs> Yeah, well, yes. No, I know who you are. Um, <laughs> but I like to allow you to self-identify. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, my parents refused to buy us a gaming system of any kind growing up, and so I just never learned how to interact with them, and therefore I'm just, like, not a fan. Like, I, I don't have the specific dexterity that you need for playing video games. Like, my I thumbs totally understand don't work that. Like that. My friend... Alexis, my old roommate and best friend Alexis, also is a Kirby stan. And I think there's something about like women who are competitive and not good at video games wanting to play Super Smash. They're like, well, if I just puff about, (laughs) then I can make this work. Puff about and mash buttons. Super Smash. Okay, so the only people that I knew... (laughs) With a gaming system was Alex, who lived across the street from me. We all know Alex from Cabbage Cast. Love her. She's all right. She had the video game system. And so, like, she would Which put one? on... Was uh, it GameCube? No, they had a... Well, I think eventually. I don't know. I, I have just the most memories of the N64. N64. And... What a throwback. We, we would play yeah. Super Smash and Mario Party because they require no understanding of how to use a video game system. Hey. <laughs> yep. Here's a fun fact about me. I love Mario Party. And Sean will never play it with me because he doesn't like it that much. And I have it on <sighs> my I have an N64 with Mario Party. I have a GameCube and I have a Switch. So y'all should come over and play Mario Party. I was with like me. literally yeah, was why say, have I, we I'm never played Mario already Party? There. I don't know. I'm already there. Even I, Haley could play Mario Party. I know. I want a Mario Party party. <laughs> Mario Party Party! Okay, I'll let you guys know when. Mario Party requires so little skill. I will make food to ensure that we have a Mario Party Party. Yeah, I'll bring food, drinks, whatever. Let's have a Mario Party Party. It's all coming together. Let's go. Uh, How do we get here? What do we... How did we... I don't know we were talking talking about about Hermione helping Hagrid. We've gotten about two sentences into this chapter. Yeah, Um, it's cool. Okay, jumping ahead a little bit. Because uh-huh. the, the whole start of this chapter is literally just, correct me if I'm wrong, them being like, Sagard's getting fired, right? And everyone's like, yeah. Yeah. We do we do have a really funny moment right at the beginning, though, where Ron gets, Ron is trying to actually do his homework. He's getting super mad because something keeps hitting the window. He goes to, you know, he's a prefect, and he's like, oh, I can, you know, let me say something. I'm a prefect. And then he comes in, it's fucking Fred and George throwing snowballs at the window. I'm like, that's just... That's classic siblings. If he wanted Fred and George to listen, he shouldn't have said, I am a prefect and you need to stop. <laughs> it's just so funny because he's just like, he, he just comes back. He's, he's, it's Fred and George. He said bitterly. It's like, he's just like a fucking <laughs> course it is. Um, why did we decide in this book? And I'm using just the royal we here that the defining character trait, they would all, there was two defining character traits of our, golden trio in this book and it is behind on homework and angry (laughs) yep i actually hermione hasn't been that angry but she she's also not behind on homework homework but she's been homework oriented for sure she's the contrast point i feel like every chapter starts with ron and harry were behind on homework hermione was knitting hats because she wasn't yep i so it's a really fun cool thing i think what (laughs) Joanne has tried to do is she's tried to set the stage of, you know, this is the OWL year, which is, you know, compared, you know, comparing to British schooling is it's a, you know, it's a fairly big point for your exams. 
And so she's trying to set the stage of, you know, there's, oh, there's tons of homework, tons of studying. It's really, really pressing. The teachers are really on us. Mm -hmm. And we already know that Harry and Ron are just really bad at being on top of their work. They're really bad at gestures vaguely. They're just, they're, (laughs) they're really bad. They're just really bad. I think that's what it's supposed to be. And I don't think it, I think it works well enough for a younger audience. But when you're, you know, reading it again, it's just kind of like, they should be, they should at least be somewhat better than this. Yeah, that's the I, thesis statement for the podcast. I wasn't better than that in high school. And I can't remember if I identified this when I was reading it in high school. But like, reading it as an adult, I'm not even like, y'all need to catch up on your work. I'm like, just stop bringing it up. Do it or don't do it. I don't want to hear yeah, about it. Shut up. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Stop making it a plot point for setting your three together late in the common room at night. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I'm like, why? It's it's such a plot point, but it's not doing anything other than placing them in a chair. There are other ways to do that. When also, Ron, Harry, Harry and Ron are the only ones out of all the fifth years who are up who are up that late. I find that yeah. incredibly unbelievable that they're the only two every single time. Yeah, like I definitely would guess I would hazard a guess that Lavender's not like great at school. <laughs> One of the girls has to not be like great at school. She does not give off the vibe of great at school. Uh, no. <laughs> no, she's a C's get degrees kind of bitch. You know what I mean? Yeah, she's a four and point. She's a four point oh in fashion merchandising and divination. Yeah, so it is annoying. They do keep mentioning it, and in a book this long, perhaps you could write something else with all those. You cut it Some out after editor the first needed... time. Go ahead. So you just cut it out after you can mention it once if you really, really want to, and then just not. Yeah. Yep. Just not. Just or it not. could be a sentence. Yeah. It doesn't have to be like the opening montage of every chapter. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, luckily, shit's about a pickup, so don't you worry. So on Tuesday, they go down for class, uh, Care of Magical Creatures class. Umbridge isn't there. Woo. That'll last. <laughs> <laughs> and Harry knows that Hagrid's wounds look like new, like fresh. They're they're not healed from when they saw him last, and we don't know why. I'm sure it's nothing. He's also carrying half a cow. Cool, 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 and cool, he's, cool, cool. And he starts it off with like a, hey guys, and they're like, welcome back, Hagrid. And he's like, great, into the forest. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, we're, we're working in the forbidden forest today, he says happily. With half a dead cow on him. The the yeah. less than forbidden forest. The only, the somewhat disclaimered forest. <laughs> and the kids are like, it says they're like darting from tree to tree to catch up with him. But like, they don't want to just walk right into whatever he's taking them to. Nobody trusts him. Not even the trio. When he walks into the woods, nobody follows. And Harry, Ron, and Hermione are like, well, I guess it's got to be us. It's like what um what is the it's the McGonagall quote from the sixth movie? Why is it whenever something happens, it's always you three? Wow, that I think that was like a movie add in, and it was it's such so a good. good one. It was it's one of the few good add-in. movie add, especially in that movie. It was it was a handful of M and M's right into that bland McFlurry. <laughs> They're in the forest, and Hagrid gives the, like a loud call. <laughs> and puts the carcass down. No, wait, hold on. I imagine, I imagine this is something like um, from the first Fantastic Beasts movie where you just, Eddie Redmayne is just making these wild animal noises. This, it's Hagrid is doing the same thing. <laughs> it's it's listed as being a shrieking cry. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone want to take a stab at it? I'm gonna blow out the mic if I try. <laughs> Face a different direction. <laughs> <laughs> all right uh I- i'm thinking like <laughs> Wait, it's so hard i'm thinking like <laughs> that's more of like a monkey it completely <laughs> cut out it completely point. cut out that's for your protection it was like a shrieking monkey situation i did i did yeah. it bad as soon as i did that cry i heard michael come down the stairs and it's not because of me he's getting a bottle for the baby but i thought for a second that i had alarmed him (laughs) it's always good wow it's always good when something happens and your partner comes running it's like okay i'm actually okay but like it's really reassuring to know i appreciate your care yes 
as I mentioned last week, I did fall down the stairs and Sean came running and I was like, oh, I'm actually okay. But it's good to know that you can come running. I've never seen you do that before. <laughs> Poor Sean. Harry's watching the Thestrals approach. We've mentioned the Thestrals another time in this book. Why? Because we need them for the climax. So we're going to mention them two times. Uh, three, because he like sees one in the distance one time. They've been like name dropped quite a bit in this book so far. I really, like they've... Yeah, really hammering home Harry has trauma. Harry, it's like his trauma is haunting him and it's a Thestral. Which is really fucking creepy. Have we brought this up yet? Is this the moment to discuss the fact that if ostensibly all you have to have done is witness death, Harry should have been able to see them from the beginning because his parents were murdered in front of him? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Or does it like not count if you don't have that as a memory? But he does have it as a memory because he faints thinking about his mom screaming dying. In right, the and so that's... Book. Yeah, yeah, that's where that's where you know you could try and make the argument that you know you have to have a conscious memory of it. That's the question. That's the question. But then do repressed memories count? Right. Well, then, I, but I think you can't. That argument becomes invalid because after Prisoner of Azkaban, where the Dementors have you know really really drudged up these memories and they're very vivid for Harry now, he should have been able to see the Thestrals from that point on, and he could not. Dear oh, reader, yeah. if you can puzzle this out. For Tell us, me this, listener. Listener, you said dear reader. Reader, whatever. <laughs> please dear tell Abby. me. Please tell me. No one is bothering to read a transcript of this podcast. <laughs> please, if anyone can think of a way that this works, please write to us. I, I need a fan theory as to how this happens. Restrictedsectionpod at gmail.com. You can write us anytime, babe. Wing it works kiss. because plot, right? That's certainly how the author approached it. You can see it. yourself out. That's that's going to be a no, bud. I don't that's like how that. the author approached it. And as a reminder to the <laughs> listeners, I'd never want them to forget that Matt is inside of his own little rave right now. So every line, <laughs> every line he says, he's in a little tiny rave in a box. I'm doing a dance again. Doing a dance. <laughs> the, said with much less gusto than last time. Are you getting tired, bud, from all that raving? I, I, I can't see it. I've put my notes right in front of it so that it will stop distracting me. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Occasionally, I'll see like. Occasionally, I'll see like one of my headphones. One side of my headphones will pop past my notes. But <laughs> for the most part, it's just the occasional. You know, Brooke or Tina's head will just pop up in the corner occasionally. <laughs> I always use my notes to obscure my own face on the Zoom call because I am extremely conceited and I cannot look away from my own face. I mean, you can talk and stare at yourself at the same time, though. I don't. I love do that it. on work calls all the time. Same. It's like it's like when you say a word too much and it loses all meaning. If you just look at your own face for a ninety-minute recording, it's like, who am I, Hedwig? What am I? <laughs> Uh, had that recently with the word task. Oh, that's a funny one. It's just, I, I had written it so many times, I started looking at it and being like, no, that's wrong. Like, it, I, wrong. I literally hit the point of, like, Googling it to make sure that it was a <laughs> word. Like, <laughs> you Googled task. It, it, it was literally like, it, it's like when you pull out your calculator just to make sure that three and four make seven. You know what I mean? You're like, I'm 99% sure that that is how that math works out. But I'm going to double check because I am going to have to say this in public. <laughs> oh, I do that all Dude. the time, and I'm an accountant. I have an account. I have a degree. <laughs> really? in, I have a degree in a math-based <laughs> subject, and I still very do funny. very basic calculations on the calculator. Well, yeah. being an e being an editor has you doing very w weird shit, like googling the definition of picture frame just to make sure you mm -hmm. know, like something fucking. And it's like, well, I know what hungry means, but like, let me see. <laughs> well, I remember. Uh, yeah. Was it last week or the week before where you? Um, in the Discord, shameless plug for the Deus Ex Media Discord. Um, for as little as a dollar a month, you too can be a part of it. I hear it's fun. You put in a you put in a question about um, the normal timeline of United States college application process for for something you yeah. edited. I remember that was just like it was that's for such a no, it was for a novel that I'm writing. I was like, hmm, are they talking about college right now? What are they talking about? I was just like, that's such a fun, that's such a fun little thing to throw in. I was just like, oh, something fun. I actually, 
Um, a while ago, I started a folder and I actually don't think I kept adding to it. Hold on. If I can do this quickly, I'm going to. Yes. I actually saved a compilation of seven funny things I've Googled while editing. And I now that I remember that this exists, I'm going to do it more. I'm going to okay. read them to you. The seven things I've Googled for the purpose of editing books exclusively. Number one, Barbie dream house. Just had to take a look-see, confirm some details. Yep. Number two, can horses walk backward? The answer is no. no. Yeah, Only if good. they're scared and it's dangerous. I was going to say, I don't think they can. They don't like to. <laughs> Three, <laughs> Christmas pinata. I don't remember what this <laughs> one is. <laughs> Four. Uh, wait. Oh, no. Okay. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> were we <laughs> trying to see if that was a tradition somewhere, or were you just looking like a for a pinata shaped like Santa? Someone beat the shit out of Santa with a baseball bat. It's a screenshot of just the search bar. So all the information I have is Google Christmas pinata. Okay. That's all the information I have. I have no memory of this. Tina's got a real personal vendetta against Santa Claus. (laughs) Okay, number whatever number we're on. Dragon's breath plumage. Like, how far does a dragon breath plume? Or... I don't know. Tina, oh, I hate to break it to, to you. It. I hate to break it to you, but um, dragons are not real. Okay, well, something else that's not real is the next thing on the list I, that I had to search is friend zone. Friend zone. Friend zone. I was probably trying to see if it was one or two words. Oh, that would make that's sense. That's a guess. Yeah. That's a guess. Next one. How medieval women wore babies. You know, there's a, there's actually a really interesting history around, like, baby slings having been used for, like, millennia. It's it's very recent that we decided to stop carrying our babies on our person. Like all the time. Like yeah. monkeys. Yeah, totally. We're a, we're a carry species. We're supposed to have our babies strapped to us. Aw, aw. Um, the very last thing in this folder, um, the last thing that I thought to save from my editor Google search was just in sync. I'm assuming yeah. we're talking about the band. The band. No context. Just in sync. <laughs> So hopefully I'll remember to start doing that again and I'll let you know in a couple months what I've Googled. (laughs) That needs to just go on Twitter every now and then, just like an image of the search bar. You're right. You're right. It's so good. How did we get here? I don't know. We're only three fucking pages (laughs) into this chapter. This chapter is 20 pages. People have trauma. No, it's fine. (laughs) Can we just jump cut to Umbridge shows up? Can we just jump cut to the kiss? (laughs) The one thing I read that before Umbridge shows up where I like, again, highlighting that Hagrid is such a bad teacher. His way of introducing the concept of Thestrals is not, you know, let's not, you're not going to say what they are. We're not going to talk about them before oh, yeah. you know, giving a name. Let's force these 15 year olds to announce to all their classmates that they have watched someone die. What yeah, the fuck? really so weird. weird. That's definitely a only like nobody you're nobody has to mention it like don't he would have to have done this before they walked into the forest like if you if people who have seen this it means that they've seen death and so like when you see them don't feel like you have to acknowledge it you know and like we can talk about but but if you want to share your experience please do you know yeah he literally starts off by being like raise your hands if you can see them and then he's like make sense make sense who did you watch die that's not informed consent that's what fucking Umbridge does. She comes in, and she, we're jumping several pages. But it was I wrote this is one. Of my, this is the only thing in my notes that's all caps. I said Umbridge fucking makes Neville tell her specifically who he watched die. What the hell? How? Trauma maker. Um. Why can Hagrid see them? Who did he watch bite it? His mommy. Nope. Yeah. His daddy. I was with his dad. His dad's probably who you're supposed to think, but he's also been around enough that he's probably seen others die as well. Well, you know, Dumbledore trusts him because that's all we hear all the friggin' time. And so my guess is Hagrid was at least a decently amount involved in the first war with Voldemort back in the eighties. And so he probably saw people die during that as well. If you want to say that, you know, maybe he didn't see his dad die, but I think you're supposed to think his dad. I mean, but okay, question. Do you have to watch someone die horrifically or if you like gently watch grandma pass in her hospital bed, are you also counted in on this? I think you're counted. Um, I recently watched a movie called Smile, which is about, it's like a cursed demon thing. And like, it like feeds on trauma. 
So like it it takes over a host and then it makes them kill themselves in front of a bunch of people and then like feeds on the trauma and like goes into the person who watched it happen. Hmm. And that's what the dust rolls are like. Wait, is that right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Trauma. I think watching Granny pass away gently in bed counts. I've never seen anyone die, I don't think. But then I think it, by the age of 15, there might be more people in this class that could see it, right? Yeah, I think so, too. I was thinking that, too. It seems like a low number. But, like, I don't know. I mean, I've never seen someone die. Like, I've seen a person dying, and I've seen a person dead. But, like, I've never seen a person dying. So I feel like maybe... If you're just like a regular kid, it's like not that common because even like my grandparents when they were dying, like my parents weren't like, OK, let's go like watch them die. It's like we'll bring you in, at, you know, before and before after. and after. Yeah, like I, I, I visited my great grandfather, you know, less than 12 hours before he died, but I was not there when he died. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of are, that. But I think that's more of like an older kid thing. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. They're 15 at this point. I don't know. I'm not trying to traumatize more children at Hogwarts. Lord knows they don't need it. But like, (laughs) well, it also just like depends on the like, I think when you're talking about like grandma and grandpa, for example, you know, like that depends on the family dynamic. And like, I don't know. I just don't know. I just don't know. Anyway, um, everyone can see that the cow in front of them is being eaten. <laughs> which is... And I, I they're just... <laughs> scared, which, like, I would be so scared. Well, and here goes back to Hagrid not being good at this. He keeps being like, oh, look, here's a couple more coming through the trees, knowing that he's already surveyed and only three people can see them. Stop telling people to look. They don't know what's there, dude. Yeah, it's like he's doing a bit, but, like, he's not. Yeah. <laughs> but he's like definitely not. Yeah. He's just earnestly like, and this one, Steve. It's like I no one can see it. It's like if some if your friend comes over to your house and you're like, look, and then you hold up your kitten and it's like, oh my gosh. And you're like talking about the kitten that they just surprised you with, but like instead of a kitten, your hands are just empty. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Right. And everyone just has to be like, if this is for a grade, I guess I have to interact <laughs> with it. <laughs> that it, that seems like a w- sideways stories from Wayside School t- type of thing where the teacher's like, I'm, maybe that's even a story from that series where the teacher's like, okay, everyone, I'd like you to take a look at the animal. And they're all like, uh, I don't see anything. And the teacher's like, well, now, just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not here. Anyway, going on with my lesson, and they're like, okay, uh, I guess it's I guess it's there, you know? Yeah. Or like a really bad intro to improv scene where someone's like, wow, look at that dog. And the other person in the scene panics and goes, I don't see a dog. Oh, my God. Improv 101. That's improv not what you Improv 101, say. say yes. Never say no. Never say no. <laughs> yes, that is a dog. It doesn't sound like that's better improv than the first option, but it is. It absolutely is. It's a whole class of a bunch of people being like, yeah, yeah, the invisible horses. <laughs> okay, so Professor Umbridge does roll up. Um, she's like, okay, so here's what happens. She's speaking to Hagrid like he has a hearing problem or a developmental issue. So in exchange, because he's earnest, he thinks that she has some kind of issue And so he's, like, miming things to her. And then so that reinforces her original prejudice that he has, like, a developmental and or, like, hearing or speaking issue. Oh, it hurts. And it's really fucked. It's really, really poor. Even for, what, 2002? It's real bad. It's bad. It's literally, like, I'm sure you've all seen it. Someone that's, like, trying to pop off on, like, a cashier out somewhere. In the wild, it's just like some shitty chick being like, maybe you didn't hear me. I need a refund. Like, it's that energy. A refund. For the whole scene. Yeah, it's really bad. Like, reading it filled me with like a real rage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all I I wrote down in my notes, I just said Umbridge is a twat. 
It's actually like, okay, straight up, it's actually really nice to finally have a villain in this series that I hate on par with the author. <laughs> Because, like, Voldemort, the man has drama. The man has pizzazz. He's got monologues. Like, he's got it all. Like, you want, and, like, we've all seen a very Potter musical. Like, we all want Voldemort to win a little bit. But Professor Umbridge, the injustice makes me sick, you know? And it's, like, to have a person in a position of power and privilege, privilege, (laughs) Privilege. take advantage of it so deeply is, like, the greatest betrayal, much like the author. I think there's something she's talking about. She's she always thought of Hermione was her self insert. No, Umbridge is her self insert, hundred percent. Like in this scene, she's being fucking egged on by Pansy Pugnose Parkinson, <laughs> which is like so stupid because like Pansy's like cackling, laughing while she's interacting with her, and it's like obviously this bitch is not being reliable or normal, like. Come on. Oh, God. I every time we see Pansy, she's just doubled over in laughter at nothing. Yeah. She's she yeah, she's so full of herself. She thinks she's hysterical. She thinks everyone's hysterical. It's also Malfoy and everyone. Reading this was not unrelatable to me looking back on my middle and high school days where like all your friends are so funny and it's like extra funny if you're being a little bit mean about it. And maybe that's just me and I had shitty friends, but like a lot of giggling in my youth for sure. I I guess so. I guess I wasn't thinking of it as like a as a teen girl. I would no, never sure. act this way though around someone in a position of authority as Definitely much as not. I hate the authority that Umbridge has. Like Especially I wouldn't interact like, to like her this. Face. Yeah. She's doing it to her face. Yeah. Like, would you pull this shit with McGonagall? I don't fucking think so. No, but it's because Umbridge is like, perfect. Keep that energy. <laughs> Tell me more man, about what you hate about this man. I wonder what McGonagall would do, though, if she, you were just, like, giggling silly, stupidly in her, her face. Just talking about, like, well, she wears such dumb hats. You can barely see what she's teaching. Like, McGonagall, you would never. Because McGonagall would literally make you disappear. <laughs> Oh, she did the, like McGonagall did it to, did it to Umbridge, and whenever it was that she, she did it to Umbridge. whenever it was she that Umbridge was in there um, spying on her class, Umbridge bas- or McGonagall wow. basically said, "Shut up, so I can do my job." Thank you. Yeah, I bet if a student was like behaving this way in front of McGonagall, McGonagall has a couple lines. The one I'm thinking of is I think when Parvati has like this big ornamental butterfly in her hair when Durmstrang and Bobaton are on their way, and she's like. She's like, Miss Patil, take that ridiculous thing out of your hair this instant. I'm sure that's, ex- she'd be like, she'd be like, Miss Parkinson, you, you stop giggling this instant. You look like a buffoon. Yes. <laughs> I'm not good at coming up with like sharp. <laughs> I like paused in the middle. I'm like, what would a mad person say? Well, so, like McGonagall just has this way. And it was, it's she, the, and Maggie Smith did a great job of bringing it to life. So it's like, you think of her saying the all these things. Is- like she, she's the only one. Yeah, but it's just like it's just a great way of you know just cutting you down at the knees and bringing you back down to earth. It's like okay, yeah, you're not hot shit. Bring it back down. Like like equitably, like she'll whoever you are, <laughs> she's like so lawful neutral that it hurts. Yeah, except for Quidditch. Oh my god! Well, everyone has their one thing. So we get three pieces of information about Thestrals. That these are the three info dumps that like we need to know for later because plot yep. exposition P- people can see them if they done see died they have a great <laughs> <laughs> wait what did you say if they didn't see died no that if, makes sense if they done see died yeah no that makes sense <laughs> they have an excellent sense of direction they're like owls and that they can get anywhere you tell them you want to go they can figure it out and you can ride them. Dumbledore occasionally rides a Thestral someplace. Which So do all magical animals have perfect senses of direction? No, I think it's just the only just two that have been mentioned. It's just need. Thestral and owls, and apparently Thestrals eat owls because they're jealous. I don't know. <laughs> I did love I that little it. tidbit. 
Vestrals are like, yo, imagine the Harry goes up to the Owlery one day and there's just a Vestral up on the shelf. Like, what? I deliver letters. I'll deliver your letter. Right. Yeah. You think this little owl is going to take that whole package? Strap it to my back. <laughs> oh, but like most of the time people come into the Owlery and they don't even see them. So they don't get any work. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> they just want to be a mail carrier. Oh. Okay. I have a, I have a question. If okay. you're writing a Thestral... In wizard's robes. And someone can't see said Thestral. Can they just see straight up your robes? Yes. And actually, Brooke, I'll have you know that the next episode I have you on um, is the I, two episodes. I, I scheduled quite far in advance, but I do have you on Fight and Flight. <laughs> okay. Which I think is when they fly away on the Thestrals in the end of this book. It so is. you'll have the opportunity to examine this further. I'm just imagining Dumbledore, like, just, like, whizzing over Britain, falls out in the wind. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> he likes how it feels. He likes a nice, you know healthy how, breeze like, around I, his privates. Thank you. He does. Thank you. Of I was course like, he I, does. I couldn't remember the quote. Like, you know how when you get home from, like, a long day of, like, work or, like, hiking and you take off your shoes and your socks and your yeah. feet finally get to, like, dry off for the first time in hours? Like, yeah. that's what he feels just floating his balls across Scotland. <laughs> Except he wouldn't feel that. He's feeling a, a sturdy, leathery Thestral underneath him. <laughs> the powerful, leathery skin of a Thestral just gently okay. cupping him. But everyone I below is just now. looking at, like, squashed balls, like the way they look when a cat okay. lays on a glass table. Yep. I understand now. I understand that it, it took, we have, and this is why we talk through it together, because I fully understand the implications of what you're saying now. And I think the answer is yes. <laughs> Thinking about all my friends that like don't wear underwear. I said all my friends, but I'm talking to you, Leela. You're not allowed to ride on a Thestral. <laughs> you're going to scar some children. <laughs> okay, so basically, this is the worst class ever. It's extremely frustrating. Professor Umbridge is. Being ableist to someone without a disability? Like, is that right? Like, yeah, that's what <sighs> she's doing. It's terrible. It's, it's so bad. It's actually pretty impressive that she's able to be this much of a bitch. Yeah. So she's like taking notes loudly. She's like, must resort to crude hand gestures. Like, she's saying shitty things about him, like, super aloud. She's challenging his lesson because Thestrals are classified as dangerous by the ministry. Yeah, which I mean, I don't know. It, I, that's, oh, uh, well, okay. I answered my own question. Do you want me to talk through what just happened in my head or we Yeah, good? yeah, yeah. God, she's so smart, guys. She's a Ravenclaw. I could just see all the synapses no, blasting behind her eyes. It's not that intense. It was more just a thing where I was like thinking about, like, okay, well, if they're dangerous, you would actually want kids to be exposed to them in a controlled environment so they could learn how to safely interact with dangerous creatures and or care for them and or defeat them. But that goes against her entire theory behind what they're trying to do here, which is actually actively avoid any real world situations that involve danger because it would overly prepare the children for the dangerous realities of the world around them. So, of course, she would not be pro to that as a concept. That was. We also know that the ministry, we also know the ministry does not like um, their, the children being prepared for dangerous creatures, as evidenced by in the last book where. A, they have the first task of the Triwizard Tournament where they send these three, supposed oh, to be right. three barely legal wizards and witches at dragons. At dragons. Like and, we know the, and we know the Triwizard right. Tournament was a ministry and ICW sanctioned event, which means that the world of wizards thinks that it's perfectly fine to throw 17-year-olds up against dragons. Oh my god, do you guys think that like maybe the government doesn't? have our best interests at heart? Wait. No. That can't be right. That can't. The no. The, the government. Even the, the government. Yeah. Is their inconsistency indicative of inner turmoil? Wait. I'm having a lot of thoughts right now. I'm going to need to think about this and get back to you. Umbridge asks Neville what he thinks of the Thestrals, and he says they're okay. And she writes down, students are too intimidated to admit they are frightened. Straight up, is this a quick quotes quill? <laughs> But I think Umbridge but, is a human quick quotes quill. Yeah, yeah. Her, she absolutely is. But also, this is like this is one of the very, 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 very few times. Is she wrong, though? I mean, Neville nervously looks at no. Hagrid before 
<laughs> saying that they're okay, I guess. I think that I think that it's I think students are too intimidated to admit they are frightened is not accurate. I think Neville, if you asked him in this moment, would say that he was being loyal, right? Like that's how I think Neville's perceiving this. I think maybe he's just going through like a deep amount of trauma being faced with the concept of like not only having to like admit in front of all of his peers that he watched his grandfather die, but also like having to sit there and like look at these like horrific creatures rip a cow apart and knowing that he's alone in this. You know what I mean? Yeah, when you put it that way. Uh, yeah. And we also we I mean, we fucking see him again in like two chapters. And let's just say that the trauma the uh the pedal to the metal the pe- trauma pedal to the trauma metal there we go yeah neville ain't good he's he ain't good you know who needs therapy everyone well, first everyone. of all every everyone. single person in this book series but if we could only afford it if like we pooled our money we could only afford therapy for one of these kids i'm getting it for it's, neville it's he's neville. the most deserving and the most yeah. receptive yep yep neville's the right choice uh, whatever december arrived and all of that jazz there, there goes the, the rest of the month. Yep, it's gone. There she blows. It's two and a half LOL, chapters on one day. Right <laughs> you know, it's just been two and a half chapters on one day, and suddenly, oh, a month is gone, and nothing important happened. Pacing. Why do the prefects have to decorate for Christmas? <laughs> I think this yeah, is hysterical. Sounds like a Hagrid job to me. Yeah, it has been previously. It has been previously. I think it still Hagrid is, too. Been. I think... I think the Hagrid thing is mainly bringing up the trees for the Great Hall, but the like, a lot of the other stuff, especially now that Hagrid's a teacher, it's like he can't really watch kids during free periods because he has to teach. And it sounds like, for the most part, the problems that Ron is bitching about are Filch and Peeves, two people that we already know he doesn't like. Well, and first years. He's old enough now to look at young kids and be like, wait, fuck this. <laughs> yeah. This is awful. It's first and second years. <laughs> He's complaining a lot. Here's the thing. Ron should never have been made a prefect. I know I've made this clear on the show, but like Neville should never have been made a prefect. But if he was, he would have risen to the occasion. Ron should never have been made a prefect. And because of that, it is other people's emotional burdens to both help him get through it and listen to him not want to do it. It's like two different kinds of like, he, this isn't for him. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. I don't want to fucking hear his mouth right now. <laughs> Do better. Exactly. And we know he won't. Well, and like, I feel it more and more because like all his siblings are like kind of cool and awesome. And like every time we hang out with them, I'm like, Ron, what? <sighs> it's like cool. The Weasleys go like this. Cool, cool, lame. Cool, cool, lame. <laughs> and then yeah. like cool. one. One little dollop of cool at the end. Yeah, well, cool <laughs> that's whip how they at the go. end. Like, sorry, but okay. If we're doing like good person versus bad person, or like there are other quantifiers, Ron wouldn't be grouped with Percy. But if our only qualifiers, I said quantifiers before. If our only qualifiers were cool or lame, I'm sorry, There's Ron, you're going in the same category as Percy. I think the worst part though is that like. Percy is lame with a distinct personality, and Ron is lame with the only defining character trait of whiny. He's really whiny, isn't yeah. he? Like, for as angry as Harry is in this book, Ron is matching him beat for beat with whiny. Equal He's proportions of whiny. Yeah. Isn't that whinging. what whinging, whinging means? Yes. Yep. So Ron's going home to the borough for winter break and Hermione's going skiing with her parents and R- Harry's like, I wish somebody loved me. I wish I had a best friend whose house I could really easily invite myself to. Like it's, I feel like it's almost funny yeah. that Harry, like the, it's like, obviously you're going with Ron. Like what? <laughs> Come right. on. People want to make sure you're doing okay. Bare minimum. There are two sides of the stupid coin right here. You have Ron, classic Ron for not telling Harry he was invited. Mm -hmm. And you have classic Harry for not thinking that I'm probably invited. I should ask Ron. Yeah, that's good. That's true. Or better yet, just Al Mrs. Weasley. That well, that's the thing. If if Mrs. Weasley wanted that message delivered, tell Ginny. (laughs) Or just write Harry a letter. God knows he doesn't get enough good mail. Yeah. Right. Harry deserves a nice Send him letter. a letter. God. No, Harry needs a howler of just being like, stop feeling 
bad for yourself. Come to fucking Christmas. I also love that we get this we get this little snippet of Hermione's concerned about the oh the all the elves that I haven't set free by Christmas and Harry's just like yeah, I'm still not willing to tell you that only one house elf is taking all these hats and it's someone who was already free. It's fucked, dude. I almost like can't talk about this anymore because it's like Harry's failing me. Hermione's failing me. Like everyone's failing. Dobby's the only one. He's carrying such a burden right now. And the burden is many hats. Well, and also the burden of now he cleans the entire Gryffindor common room on his own. Yeah, that is a great burden. She's quadrupled yeah. his workload and hat load. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then still the hats don't make time. the cleaning easier. But then he still find he still makes time to completely deck somehow get Harry's meeting room in the room of requirement and decorate it for Christmas. Have a he, very hairy Christmas. Okay. Please he tell me this was illustrated. Please bobbles. tell me this has been illustrated bobbles. in the illustrated edition. Do we uh, have bobbles? Yes. Yes. It's actually pretty funny because like it's a janky illustration of Harry and like the illustrator obviously of the illustrated editions is like very very good but like i was wondering if like maybe someone's kid or something like did that doodle of harry i'll take a picture i'll show you guys <laughs> and i just want to take a moment to reiterate i have the new order of the phoenix illustrated edition that came out whatever whenever and i just want to like be clear that i received that as a gift from my in-laws every year and i don't feel comfortable engaging in like that conversation and i still very firmly feel that i am not too like I don't purchase anything that supports the franchise and there's the new game coming out next month as well um what what's it called is it called Hogwarts Legacy yeah what's the isn't the app called Hogwarts Hogwarts Mystery Hogwarts Mystery is the app oh my god it's their way of being like Harry they're like it's not Harry Potter you know you don't like Harry Potter anymore like here it's Hogwarts I, Mystery anyway we're I know, not doing that yeah, either. I know we're not. I, I do want to say one thing about. I think you know, with, there's a lot of talk about, you know, what's going on with Warner Brothers. What do they want to do? I honestly, given that Warner Brothers recently basically came out and said, yeah, we're done making you know films and TV shows. I think Warner Brothers is just saying, let's push out whatever we've already put money into. We'll get yeah. something back on it, and then wash our hands of this. I I think that's what they're doing, and so that's why my my hope is that you know Hogwarts Legacy is probably the last big thing we're gonna see. Sorry, I'm loudly putting new weed in my grinder. I have heard news that they're like considering a whole reboot of the series. The I film, film have series. heard the same, and like, surely <laughs> that almost like makes me want to cry. Like, surely they can't. <laughs> surely, oh my god, please put that money anywhere else. I like, know. stop putting money. Like, do it's something ostensibly else. like been long enough. In terms of the way that studios reboot this stuff. But there are some things that you just should never... Don't reboot Lord of the Rings. No one ever needs to do another Lord of the Rings film. That's true. Those you know what I mean? Plenty good. Yeah. And plenty long. Harry Potter is fine as is. You don't need to ever touch it again. It's good. It's good enough. And especially given the author's problems. Well, those are the Fantastic Beasts thing. The actor's problems, too. Like, you've got a whole yeah. host of problems. You just need to wash your hands. Wash your hands. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's like kind of how I like I always reach like a saturation point with franchises. Just like even like the problematic shit aside. I'm having this with Marvel right now. I'm having this with Star Wars. I cannot possibly be called upon to care anymore about anything else in this universe. Like you have sapped it dry. Mm -hmm. And so like with Harry Potter, I feel like at this point, Every single thing that any studio could possibly do in any kind of media would be it it just feels like a desperate money grab. Every single move they make feels like a desperate money grab. And it's like disgusting. There's a point where I'm when I'm pumping breast milk at night. This is a fun analogy. Feel free to cut this. You hit a point where your tits are just dry. They're done. And the thing is that your body will keep producing breast milk as long as you're telling it to keep producing breast milk, but it will slow to like a single drop at a time. And there are times where I'm like, well, I need more. And it's like, is it worth investing another 30 minutes to get like half an ounce of milk out? And the answer is no. And we're at the point with all these franchises where there's like a quarter of an ounce of milk left and you need to just take that time and go anywhere else. 
beautiful analogy. No, that's that's exactly what this is. It feels like it feels like Warner Brothers is desperately sucking at the teat of the Harry <laughs> Potter franchise and coming up dry. And we need to we need to get off the pot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway, that's just been our little sidebar. I sorry, this episode's already gonna be super long without that, but we sometimes you just need to say shit. I think it's important to discuss too. So yeah, for sure. Okay, where the hell are we? We're at the last defense. Very Harry Christmas. Very Harry Christmas, Christmas yeah. which is so it's so good. It's so I'll good. I'll put the picture. I'll put the picture on our Instagram. Okay, he. <laughs> okay, first of all, he walks into the room. Wait, for, first of all, is a bobble like a Christmas ornament? Yes, right? the, one yeah. of the little circle ones, like the, the balls, little the okay. spheres. Okay. Um, he is immediately embarrassed and he runs and they like takes all of them down which like wow i would have loved that personally i would have been like guys look the bobbles have my face on them yeah i think harry was worried in the perfectly 15 year old boy self-conscious way that people would think that That he he made them them or requested them because you'd get some prick like zachariah smith who'd just be like what the hell are you doing yeah zacharias would have walked up in that room and been like fuck you i'm out (laughs) Okay, so 31-year-old me, which is now me, doesn't care about that. But I guess 15-year-old me would have been embarrassed about that. Yeah. 25-year-old me would love that, but... (laughs) You could, like, summon Dobby and be like, you have to wait here until people get here. And then... (laughs) And then make him tell them that <laughs> there <laughs> it is. <laughs> You're like, you have to stand here and take credit for this. Oh, Dobby, can you be the usher for my very fancy Christmas meeting? Can you just greet people when they come in, tell them what you did, and leave them to their cushion? He didn't yes, know what is he going to do? Try to like sprint down to the kitchen and be like, Dobby, get your ass upstairs right now. No, I bet. Guarantee I bet you could Harry call Potter, for Dobby, and Dobby would yep, show up. I bet instantly. if Harry Potter says, Dobby, I need you, Dobby's there. I bet. He never tries it, but. Wait, does he try it? He does try it. At, in the seventh book, isn't that how Dobby gets there? In the no, because he he uses the in the, end? in the seventh book he uses he oh, yeah, uses the Aberforth. shard of the mirror and Aberforth sends. Okay, okay, okay. Dobby, yeah. right, ignore me, ignore me. I actually don't know anything about Harry. Potter. I think the only time we see Harry actually call for el- for an elf is during Half Blood Prince, where he calls for creature because Pretty creature old. is but his creature elf. belong to him. Yeah. Luna Lovegood is the first person who enters. I love Luna Thank so God, much. I love her so much. <laughs> she okay. Okay, so she's like talking to him and she's like, oh, look, mistletoe. And there's like mistletoe over Harry and Luna. Are they both there? Because that's like even funnier. Than they, I, I, I think, they, I think um, the, so. Yeah, the way I've always read is they are both under it. And Luna's just like, <laughs> let me get your consent. Which is I just like love Luna. <laughs> Wait, I, so you think. Okay, so Luna's like there's mistletoe. Harry jumps away. Luna's like good thinking. There's probably Nargles in there. So, Matt, are you speculating that Luna is like, I'm going to kiss this guy. And then she's like, hmm, I'll point out that there's mistletoe to gauge the room. Right. Yep, and she's it, like, yep. Oh, mistletoe. Oh, interesting. I think, okay. I think I actually buy that. I, have, I buy that yeah. too. And that's probably the move I would make. I have always, I have always had in my head, you know, Luna is, you know, we, Luna's a Ravenclaw. So she's very smart, even if it's not the, you know, the Hermione style of very book smart. I dubbed it last episode. She's mad scientist smart. Yeah. Same yeah. category as Haley. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But no, Luna, Luna's very smart. She's very observant. And I, so I think she, she's been around Harry enough this year or this, you know, this term to know you kind of, you know, he's a little jumpy right now. He's, you know, he's going through a lot. <laughs> Approach slowly. <laughs> Approach slowly with great caution. And so I, th- but I, I also, I th- also think Luna's just the kind of person she's like, well, I'm, I'm going to make sure this is okay before I do it. Cause I'd, yeah, ra- I'd okay. rather keep I a like friend. That. I'd rather keep my friend than. Well, here's the thing is like, I don't even think Luna would. Luna is 100% the type of person who, like, shows up at a bar and walks up to someone. She's like, I don't want anything serious, but I'd like to fuck, so you down? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I, she's not trying to date Harry here. She's just like, yeah, would be dope. Exactly. And that's what we see in the in Half-Blood Prince, where she goes, they go to Slughorn's party, is just, Luna's just so happy just to be involved. And she's yeah, like, like, like I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad I'm good enough friends with you that you thought of me and wanted to invite me. I have, like, in my life, slept with a lot of friends because that's just the kind of person I am. Like, I'll just sleep with you. You know what I mean? Like, wink. Um, <laughs> anyway. Like, I do totally get this energy. You're just, like, drunk at a party with, like, a friend. And then you're, you're like, getting, like, a little bit of a feeling. So you're like, do you want to make out? And they're like, what? No. And you're like, oh, yeah, cool. Okay. No, that that's cool, too. To- that's totally was always an option. <laughs> no, but you're I right. I just was that- confirming. <laughs> 
nope, you're right. We should eat instead. We should just eat instead. For the record, that's never happened to me. I have a 100% success rate with the question, do you want to make out? And now that I'm married, it'll, well, I'll actually, I guess, <laughs> I guess Sean kind of ruined my record. <laughs> but before that. <laughs> I don't have a 100% success rate because I'm terrible at picking up women. And so my entire experience of being bisexual up to this point in my life is me looking at girls and being like, I think I'm feeling this and be like, hey, do you want to make out? And they're like, I'm very straight. And I'm what, like, really? So okay. here's, the, here's my experience. Here's my experience with women is that like even the ones who aren't into girls still usually say yes to me. Is it because I'm so charming? I there's a thing where I'm only doing it to girls that are totally sober because I'm always totally sober. Wow. That's a great point, Brooke. And I've almost <laughs> never kissed a girl straight before. <laughs> I said straight, but I meant sober. <laughs> I don't think you can I'm kiss a girl, kiss a girl in the straight way. But yeah, I, I, I don't think it's possible for you to kiss a girl straight either. Kiss Just a girl thinking. straight on the mouth. You know what I mean? <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, enter Angelina. Katie, Alicia, they've just come from Quidditch where they have replaced Harry with a Ginny Weasley. Would you look at that? It's She's back in the ring as a character. Yep. And Harry's like, wait, what? And they're like, yeah, she's actually pretty good. And he's like. <laughs> the girls are like, we're actually not mad about the replacement. Right. And Harry's like, is that a tingle I feel in my nether regions? No, can't it's be. a it's a monster in his stomach. We we hear about it in the next book all the time. It's a monster oh, yeah. in the stomach. Disgusting. Uh, They've also replaced Fred and George with some randos. It doesn't matter who. Cooten Peaks. <laughs> yeah, they're made up characters. Dude, I'm just. There's got to be a point in this book in particular <laughs> where it's like, fuck, I got to name another character. It's going to be like name like a Wu-Tang Clan name generator. It's like uh, it's going to be um, Big Boy uh, Fatso. <laughs> got it. Big Boy Fatso. He's the new seeker. <laughs> I think we get that in the next book because we have the whoever the I just said their names. I don't remember the two beaters that are just now. Then they get two different beaters in the next book. That are, again, just random names that oh, get no personality. Andrew Kirk and Jack Sloper. Yeah, those are made up names. Those are like Who? Jack Ryan names. It's like, are you a dude? Are those the ones in this book? Yeah. Oh, then maybe the yeah. maybe the names I have are the ones from the next book. You have no memory of this place because it doesn't matter and it's boring. Andrew Kirk. I. Andrew? Okay, one time. What, Andrew? You guys remember uh you guys remember my friend Courtney who came on the dreaded 420 unspectacular episode? <laughs> yes. One time Courtney and I were driving somewhere, maybe like it was the Outer Banks or something. It was like a good solid car ride, and it was either just the two of us or the person we were with was not feeling chatty because Courtney and I played two games. And it took the entire car ride, and the first one was name every Harry Potter character you can think of, and the second one was name every game uh, Song of Ice and Fire character that you can think of. And let me tell you that if you are fucking nerds, that game will take like those two games together will fill up a six hour car ride. <laughs> and let me just tell you that Courtney and I listed so many fucking names from Harry Potter and Andrew Kirk was not one. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I feel like those. Those games take a long time, just even when we're drunk playing, because you have those as tiles on your drunk Jenga, don't you? And they still true. take Harry forever. Potter, Harry Potter characters. I'm, I'm just imagining now Warner Brothers to being like, we're creating a spin-off series following Andrew Kirk and Jack Sloper. <laughs> Who? <laughs> you know, those classic characters, Andrew <laughs> Kirk and Jack Sloper. Not even nearly as cool as Faye Dunbar. <laughs> Faye Dunbar Justice for Faye is that bitch though. Justice for Faye Dunbar. <laughs> okay, so enter everyone. Pursued by a bear. Just kidding. <laughs> Harry's like, we'll only be practicing what we've learned already rather than trying something new because it's the week before the holidays. Which and is such a good te- it's a, such a good teacher move too. Like it's a great teacher phenomenal move. teacher move. It's, like, not about having class. It's about, like, the camaraderie of feeling like a group when you're, like, going into the holidays. And Work also does feeling it too. good at stuff. Harry. Yeah. I, again, stand by. Harry should have been a professor, not Nora. 
Oh my god, yes. I can't even talk about it. Actually, in April, our bonus episode on the Patreon is going to be called Career Day, and we're going to talk about the different career tracks uh, in the <laughs> wizarding world. So, entrepreneur, government. <laughs> Uh huh. So join Professor. the restrict- join the restricted Professor. section Patreon and- for five dollars a month. Thank you, Matt. I've- I have him so well trained. <laughs> yeah, because I, I was supposed the to be Quidditch your co-host. player is another one. Oh, yep. Quidditch player is a very real option, apparently. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I get. It's like the English system where it's like, yeah, there's like the good leagues, but there's also just like the football club down the street. You know yeah. what I mean? So as as the resident sport knower. I can tell you that the English football league. So there's a ten. There's four. There's four levels of. Wait, real quick, Matt. I just have to say that Brooke does know more about sports than most of the rest of the people who come on this show. Then we're, I'm very then we're doing I'm great. uninformed about uh, like European other football. world football, American I football. Want, I don't want you I to get bad slam. rap, Brooke. No, it's okay. I don't know anything about football. I know American football exceptionally well. Uh, so that's it. English football, um, obviously, it's a it's a pyramid of different leagues. Um, where the top the top league is the best, and you work your way down to eventually getting to those random clubs down the street. Um, the way the English football pyramid works is there are four there are four levels in the top tier of the pyramid, and those are you know those are the big professional clubs. They're the the main ones you hear about. But then there's another subset of like five or six more leagues of you know like semi pro teams. That are, you know, they're not very good, but they're still there. And then you work your way down to, you know, being outside of the pyramid. And then you've got like hundreds and hundreds of teams down there that are just really bad. So it's like if Quidditch works the same way, which maybe it does, there's only so many people in the wizarding world. Like I would guess in all of England, what we think like 50 thou, 50 thou wizards. Yeah, probably. That's a decent estimate. How many people are in the UK? I stopped listening. You guys are doing math and sports. Just let me know when I should tap back in. I'm just <laughs> I'm, reading text. I'm just saying, like, if if there's the same structure to Quidditch as there is to the UK football system, then like, ostensibly, like everybody that liked Quidditch at Hogwarts could play professionally. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. every single one of them that just liked it and was okay at it could play professionally. Yeah, that's true. Wait, I'm gonna add, I'm gonna add this to my math and Harry Potter notes. Yeah, how this, how many valid. wizards do we think are in the UK? And if so, what is the proportional number of open Quidditch slots based on the UK football system? Perfect. I zoned out and I zoned back in just in time. <laughs> well, and you've got it working okay. for you too that a, a Quidditch team is smaller than a football team. Football teams are um, eleven on a pi- on the pitch at a time. Quidditch is only seven. Right. So it works out well for the difference between. Yeah. Muggle and wizarding populations. So that's been sport, sports with, uh, with Matt and Brooke. <laughs> sports and math, are our favorite segment. Okay, so I finished typing that. <laughs> cool, we just wrapped up. We just wrapped that. While so. there's two people on my podcast talking about this, I'm making a note to, at a later date, have two other people talk about it on my podcast. At no time, you may notice, will I be talking about this on my podcast. That's a smart move. Okay, just like a little quote. Neville, quote, had improved beyond all recognition, and unquote. And this is Harry saying that. Harry's so proud of him. I feel like oh, Harry, especially, like, Harry knows Neville, but, you know, better than most of the, you know, outside of Ron and Hermione. He knows Neville probably pretty, pretty well. And so he knows where Neville's coming in, both at, you know, at a skill level in, you know, in terms of using magic, but also his confidence. I think that's the biggest thing. Harry's super proud of you know, helping Neville gain some confidence. I think he's able to, it's the biggest growth. Absolutely. Well, and, and like Harry keeps working with him personally, which is like really nice. And then when Harry needs to go do other shit, he puts him with Ron and Hermione, mm-hmm. which must be at least like a comfortable learning environment. If I don't know, you know what I mean? Even if they're fighting with each other, you're friends yeah. with them. He probably feels safe there. Do y'all, do y'all think that, you know, Obviously, you know, if you remember the first the first meeting, you know, Harry pairs with Neville because now no one else pairs with Neville. Do mm-hmm. y'all think that Harry kind of takes that as a personal challenge? Just like, I'm going to make Neville better than all of you because <laughs> y'all y'all gave him the middle finger. I'm going to make Neville like maybe the backup chosen one. You know what I mean? 
Neville's got some stuff to do later in this series, and I need him to be prepared for it. We actually need Neville to get pretty hot pretty quick. Okay, so let's get this done. <laughs> yeah, come on. Where's that glow up, Neville? Okay. Are you guys ready for the next thing that happens? No. It's happening right now. <laughs> Harry sends everyone home for the holidays. It's Except Cho. right now was the exact <laughs> thought that went through my head on my first kiss, I'm pretty sure. I'm just like, oh, it's happening. It's happening right now. Okay, everyone leaves except Cho. And Harry's like, let me work my magic on this hoe. And then he turns around, or she turns around. Somebody turns around. around. And she's like crying. She's so, and she's I, I'm sorry that I'm laughing, but like, girl, come on. <laughs> Don't do this to him. <laughs> If you really like anyone. him as much as you say that you do, <laughs> you should not be crying. Get yourself right. I wouldn't, like, do this to my husband. Get yourself right before you make this move. You know what I mean? <laughs> I would probably only pull this move on, like, my closest of girlfriends. And if only if I was in, like, extremely urgent need. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I wouldn't be, like, <laughs> I'm still crying about the thing from six months ago. Ugh. Okay. okay, here's the thing. Uh-huh. <laughs> no one looks cute while they're crying. That's a movie wait, falsehood. Wait, some people do. Hold on. No, who? <laughs> outside, <laughs> of a, outside of a film environment where they're not really crying. Yeah. Well, it's not like I've seen a lot of people cry, you know, except for myself. And let's just say, like, well, there's a difference between weeping and bawling. Just, yeah, I'm that's a lovely the, weeper. That's the, Cho's not, like, it's not just, you know, tearing up or something. She is sobbing. Right. <laughs> I'm like I'm imagining he turns around and then she's literally in the middle of the room with like her face all screwed up like <laughs> it's just like wish I could do this is it? she doing um is she doing like those like shuddering breaths when you like cry so hard? absolutely you know I, mean? I, I think that's what she's doing right before she moves in on Harry she's doing the like steadying breaths where she's like anyhow um I really like you oh uh, there's mistletoe so look mistletoe okay. what are normal okay She's thinking about Cedric. <laughs> and my notes, literally, I'm so sorry for the kind of person I am, but my notes from when I wrote them eight months ago literally say, she's thinking about Cedric. Ha 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 That's what I wrote. <laughs> she's thinking about another man. I So there's the... I'm sure that was very traumatic for her. I literally had a driver's ed teacher who... Stopped the our driver's ed class one whole day and just told us about how her boyfriend at 17, who she intended to marry at the age of 17, which probably would not have panned out the way she was thinking it would, died racing cars. And that's what inspired her to become a driver's ed instructor. Wow. What? Full okay. time. She is oh otherwise... Gosh. I know she like she'd mentioned her like husband and children and stuff previously. So like, you know that she like went on and had a whole life. But it's like if that random lady is still bringing up her traumatic death of her first boyfriend at 17, like Mm -hmm. 40 years later being like, and that's why I'm a driver's ed instructor to this day. I don't think Cho's ever getting over this. I I remember two things vividly from driver's ed. One was (laughs) we got to play Mario Kart on the last day of the class because our Gym teacher was awesome. That's actually very funny. And the second thing I remember, he was, we were, when we, obviously he's got to have a day where he talks about, you know, not drinking and driving. And I just vividly remember he says, you shouldn't drink and drive. You know, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't go out drinking after, you're driving after having a couple beers. And I don't know why you'd want to have a beer anyway, because it tastes like piss. Anyway, and he just moves on. They don't all taste like piss. Some of them definitely do, though. (laughs) All the ones that are left at your house. like, Like bread. Bread, yeah, bread and bread is good, if you ask me. Bread is good. That's a pers- that's a hot take I know. I like baking with beer because I find it adds a really nice, like warm flavor to a lot of baked goods. Mm, interesting. Ooh, the Guinness, like gin- is it Guinness? The gingerbread yeah. that two and a half Irishmen make. Mm-hmm. You know yep. you know oh, what yeah. I mean. I know what you mean. Uh so let's tune back in with our boy Harry. He's feeling bad about this encounter. <laughs> like as it's happening he's like while it's happening he's like is 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 she going in and she <laughs> and then it phased and then there's a, a line break well he's like she was much too close which first off yes. not a vote of confidence he's mm-hmm. not like oh wow she's really close to me 
Um, but she's not even noticing I... anything. Like, oh, her eyes, her eyes, which were so close to mine, looked you know they were you know sparkling or something. You know, they are they are wet. Tears. No, yeah, he but, literally like, says he could see she... every tear clinging to her eyelashes. And he's, basi- that's, that's he's basically like, uh, yeah, she's way too close for comfort. Okay, so this is a fade to black kiss, which is a hilarious concept so because bad. you can have a kiss and still have it be rated PG. But like for some reason. For some reason, we had to fade to black on the kiss. Okay, here's exactly what happened here. It got written. It was fucking awful. And an <laughs> editor came in and was like, we are putting a goddamn ellipses here. It's the one, t- the one time the editor did anything in this book. Yeah, like that's the what. So the, the, they weren't allowed to do anything else. It was this was their <laughs> win. They were they were like, I don't care. Publish the bad comma mistake. But we are taking out the kissing paragraph. <laughs> Okay, so this is like a chaste, damp peck on the lips, right? That's what we're like envisioning. Like pretty reserved. Oh, absolutely. Maybe some giggles. Absolutely. It is, there is nothing, you know, it's not steamy or anything. La, la, it la, is. La, 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 la. We're not tonguing. No, I disagree. <laughs> I think they took it straight to the pillows. Okay. Room so, of requirement well, first, gives you whatever right you need. down to the stun pillow. Room of requirement, wink. Room, 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 room of requirement so popped a bed into the corner <laughs> for them and they weren't brave enough to take advantage of it. <laughs> Hogwarts is like, I know what's up. I know what you want. Room of so, requirements has got to be the fuck room, right? Well, Absolutely. Yes, yes. We, we, we've we actually discussed this at length before. It's the fuck room. <laughs> right. So We and everyone at this school would use it for such. So this is Harry's first kiss. You know, it's a moment for our hero and nobody's required to share the story of their first kiss, but I'll gladly share mine because <laughs> I love talking about myself. So <laughs> when I was in like seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, I dated and I'm like using extreme air quotes right now, this guy named David, and he's a very good dear friend of mine to this very day. He's also gay, which would explain why. <laughs> we almost never touched each other for like much of this time and like somewhere in there in that three year period during which we were dating but not really engaging with each other whatsoever we got dared to make out at a party and it was my I, I think this this maybe wasn't my first kiss kiss but maybe it was I don't know it all blurs together nothing means anything and so like we made out at this party and I forgot to mention that I had braces at this time and so we broke apart it was like in front of all our friends we broke apart and he's like, um, like a humor to cope with the trauma kind of guy. So he was, he cracked a joke and he was like, I think my lips are bleeding from your braces. <laughs> and all of our friends laughed at me. And that was the end of it. <laughs> like, unfortunately, I have no funny story to tell because my first kiss was actually perfect and magical. That's the story of how I lost my virginity. It's like, no one wants to hear it. It was beautiful and tender. Like, yeah. it was fine. <laughs> like, my my partner at the time, she and I had been dating for like six months. At the time, she had not yet transitioned. She would go on to do that later in life. But so I used partner for this instance. Like, literally, we were at my first official like high school dance. And they dipped me under twinkle lights and kissed me at the end of the dance during a slow song. Like Wait, literally that's like oh really my God. precious Brooke. <laughs> oh my yeah. God, what a magical moment. Yeah, it was perfect. And, and even, they didn't even drop you. No, it was perfect. Incredible. <laughs> I'm cackling because it's like uh, unrealistically perfect. I know it was like, un- <laughs> it was literally like a perfect magical moment. And even better is like, I had already planned like a sleepover with a bunch of girlfriends after the dance so i got to go immediately from that to a sleepover of like giggling girls to like tell them that my first kiss was perfect so validating it was amazing (laughs) oh my god and and they all had they all had like a ron level reaction to it as well it was everyone was just like so excited for me (laughs) (laughs) like fist bumping because like let's cut to it because he do be like fist bumping right ron is rolling on the carpet thrilled matt sorry what is what was your first kiss if you, only if you if want to no it so it was let's see this would have been it would have been summer before 10th grade my partner and i we met doing a show that summer and she and i were uh one theater of the theater kids theater huh? kids yep so one of the num- one, one of the dance songs <laughs> mine was also a story. theater kid 
we were we were dance partners for one of the songs, so we just I had not spoken a word to her at that point because I had a, you know, I had a bunch of other friends already that I hung out with and talked with a lot. But so we just started talking now that we were dance partners and we just kind of really clicked. So we started dating um, after the show was over. And I remember we were so we were hanging out on the porch at her parents' house and her parents were uh, they are very, very well off. So they lived in a nice area. So a solid porch. Situation. So it was a very solid Sounds porch like. with like a hammock and everything. It was, you know, away from prying eyes. And we just, we were like edging each other on it the whole, we were there for several hours just sitting there talking and hanging out. We were just kind of edging <laughs> oh God, it. The tension. We were edging it for hours. And then <laughs> at this point, neither of us could drive at this point. So I, we had, someone had to take me home. And so <laughs> we were, we were standing up to go in and we just kind of stopped and stood there and then just you know, kissed under the porch light. Oh, where all the mosquitoes were hanging out. All the, it was August, so there were absolutely all the mosquitoes <laughs> hanging out. <laughs> right in and tell us what your first kiss experience was. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you want to. So we cut to Harry's, like, stumbling back into the common room. And, like, here's the crazy thing. Hermione knows exactly what has occurred. Do we think that the girls were, like, chatting? Like, was Cho like, hey, I think I'm going to try to kiss Harry. Do you think I should go for it? And Hermione was like, oh, fuck, yeah, he's real into you. No, I think Hermione just, Hermione knew as soon as it was just Cho left. Because doesn't she, like, drag Ron off? Yes. And so I think Hermione knew. I believe that Hermione would, like, walk up to Cho and be like, you're interested in Harry, right? Okay, well, he's into you, too. You should make a move. He's really shy. Like, I feel like she would do that. I also, I, I kind of see Matt's point, though, because I, I used to have a, a rule when I was traveling. The last two people left in a hostile common room are fucking. Hmm, the last fine. two people that end up in a hostile common room together are going to sleep together that evening. And that's going to be the name of your memoir, right? <laughs> I can't write that book because I. <laughs> have children and it would Brooke, be so you traumatizing you should have written the book before you had the children just like priorities you know what i'm saying uh, if i if i finish the book that i had started working on and probably will never finish about my travels i am cutting out roughly 90 percent of the sex and there's still a lot of sex in it um, <laughs> i'm just keeping it to people that that served a narrative purpose <laughs> that's fun um, but yeah, anytime you're in a room, the same thing with parties. If you're in a giant room at a party and it's a bunch of people and people start like peeling off and going to bed, the last two people that are left in that room are at least going to make out. It, I can't it, say, yeah, I can't say I've never been in that position. It just is what it is. And you guys, <laughs> you know it too. You're both like vibing with each other and you're talking and people keeping like, oh, it's getting late. I'm going to go. And you're like, yeah, I think I'm just going to like stay significant. Look at the only other person in the room. <laughs> and they're like, they'll do the exact same thing. They're like, yeah, I think I'm going to hang out for a little bit longer. Like everyone's really calm about it, but it's like an understood <laughs> part of human interaction. If you're the last two people. So you in guys going to bang? Okay, cool. Have fun banging. I'll leave now. Yeah, that's cool. So that's yeah, what I'm doing I'm wrong. For you. Text me in the morning. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, just take an Uber. Love you. Bye. That's what I'm doing wrong. I keep leaving. I keep <laughs> yeah, leaving. That's, that's my problem. It's a waiting game. If you can stay up till 4 a.m., you can fuck anybody. I actually can't emphasize this enough. You need to leave the party when the host seems like the party's over. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have what... had a guy try to sleep with me via like haunting me throughout a party, and it didn't work because no. I took another guy to bed, and he slept on my couch because he got too drunk, and he heard me fucking this other guy. Oh, sorry, <laughs> bud. <laughs> No, that's what I did at your at your at the New Year's party though, Tina. <laughs> it was you uh, said you said you wanted everyone out by three, and it was you know like it was about a quarter till two. I was like, I need the next hour fifteen to sober up so I can drive home. All right. Oh, that's what you were referencing. I was like, you haunt fucked somebody <laughs> at the New Year's party. I've been hosting parties my entire adult life, and only this very past like week or two has it occurred to me that when I'm planning on getting really shit faced at a party at my own house. I should set a reminder on my phone that says like one hour until the party's over. Because what happens is I don't set that alarm and then people are at my house and I'm like, oh God, I want to go to bed. But my house has like 30 people in it. So if I set the hour reminder, it makes a loud noise. Everyone at the party, I'm like, oh my God, hour reminder. My phone says it's out of my hands. And then an hour later, the next reminder goes off and it's like everybody out and they already were forewarned of this. And then I'm like, phone says everyone out. You guys got to go. It like literally takes some responsibility off of me almost. You know what I mean? 
See, my problem at your New Year's party was that you know, we played drinking games for a while. My problem was we got to 1130 and I decided that instead of having more of the cocktail, I would have scotch. Straight scotch. No, it's a good choice. Like, I I, I encourage people to drink the liquor because God knows nobody who lives here does. Your scotch is potent, especially when there's nothing else in it and you're playing a drinking game with it. Were you drinking Were you drinking <laughs> the scotch that Andrew brought from his grandmama's home? I don't know. It was on your shelf. I think, I think it was, well, Andrew brought some really old liquor from his grandma's house to my house, I think, around Halloween. So, who knows? Who knows? Anyway, let, guys, let's get back into it. Okay, because Hermione business like is asking if Cho cornered him after the meeting, which LOL. This is like choice. this is like the PG way of writing. Did you guys do? Did you fuck? <laughs> and Harry's like, we fucked with our mouths. And Hermione's like, as I suspected. And Ron's literally just starts immediately losing every last bit of his shit. Just rolling on the floor. Fist pumping. Like, like if, whooping. Yeah. Ron, like, is, Ron is dude bro dude broing so hard right here. Ron does everything but fist bump him. <laughs> yeah. I feel like Ron has entered like some kind of a delusional state from like all of the stress he's under. Like this boy has never had to try at anything. And he has like the burden of Quidditch and fifth year homework and prefectship upon him. Like, I feel like Ron I feel like Ron is like near his breaking point right now, straight up. You know what I mean? I, th- I also think this is awesome. This is like this is a, a rare moment for Ron where he's not jealous of Harry at all. He's just mm-hmm. like awesome, dude. He's yeah. just so happy it for him. It is pure, yeah, pure hype for his boy. Does anyone have like the book open in front of them? Yes. What do you need? No. Can you just like read the like the dialogue? Like d- like what? <laughs> it's just like quite funny. Like the whole like wet. Are you bad at yeah. kissing? Well, Ron said finally, looking up at Harry. How was it? Harry considered for a moment. Wet, he said truthfully. Ron made a noise that may have indicated jubilation or disgust. It was hard to tell. (laughs) Wait, what noise is that? Like, (laughs) like, uh. (laughs) it's like, what do you think, uh? Matt? (laughs) Okay, those are all really good. (laughs) Because she was crying, Harry continued heavily. Uh, (laughs) Oh, yes, this is in this is in the author's adverb phase where everything has to have an unrelated adverb. Yo, I made a TikTok about that today. (laughs) Oh, said Ron, his smile fading slightly. Are you that bad at kissing? Dunno, said Harry, who hadn't (laughs) considered this and immediately felt rather worried. Maybe I am. (laughs) Oh, my God, it's so fucking funny. It (laughs) is. Yes, it really is. It is a comedy gold moment. <laughs> I wish we had gotten this exact scene. We needed this in, in the, the movie. movie. Yeah, the, the, just take the text right from the book. This word is word for word. This is this gold. Movie's like very, the movie's like very prissy compared to this. Yeah, my favorite part is that immediately after that, Harry's like, "Oh fuck, I hadn't considered that," and Hermione's like, "Oh you, my god," Hermione's like, "You fucking idiot." She's like, "Here's how emotions work." Hermione, Hermione is li- has all literally the- here to be these boys' mother, assistant, therapist, and best friend, like all at the same time. Hermione yeah. literally has a lot of work. all the EQ in the group. Um, literally, she's she. <laughs> My favorite part is she's like, yeah, chose a real sad girl because <laughs> you know the whole dead boyfriend thing. And Ron is like, you'd think a bit of kissing would cheer her up. Ron said, grinning, and Hermione. <laughs> Literally is like, okay, so I was going to be nice about this, but now I'm going to explain some things to you. <laughs> you are the most insensitive wart I've ever had the misfortune to meet. Yeah. Hermione's like, if I'm ever, if he's ever going to stand a chance with me, I need to start correcting behavior now. Right. But I mean, literally runs like, well, what sort of person cries while they're kissing? And <laughs> Hermione's like. Ugh. All right, let's, let's lay all this out okay. for you in this really long paragraph. <laughs> Hermione knows because she obviously had a smoocheroo with Victor Crumb, right? And she's like, it can be an emotional time for a woman. Dude, Hermione absolutely. Because they even, that's the button on this chapter where he's like, who are you writing? writing She's she's writing to Crumb. I don't know, Victor. It's just like a little, it like, (laughs) okay, here, I almost feel like Harry and Cho's chemistry, aka nothing, couldn't carry the this chapter of their first kiss so they had to add that Hermione was writing a letter to Crumb to make this a little bit sexier you know what I mean like give a little more jazz a little more je ne sais quoi because they have chemistry baby 
Well, uh, yes, they do. And then also <laughs> Hermione doing the Lord's work is like, um, are you going to ask her out? And Harry's well, hold like, on. We, we, can't, we can't skip the emotional range of a teaspoon line. It's Correct. kind of legendary. Go ahead. I already read it in the intro. She says, just uh-huh. because you've got, wait, actually, this is my redemption. Just because you've got the emotional range of a teaspoon doesn't mean we all have. Yeah. Which it's just, it's so, it's such a great line. It's well, it's so well delivered. I love in the book where she, she says it and just kind of leaves it there. She, you know, she just continues to do what she does because they totally ruin it in the movie by having that awkward group laughter. Mm hmm. My favorite mm-hmm. is Harry's immediate line after that, though. because <laughs> She started Harry, it. Yeah, she... <laughs> she was the one who started it. I wouldn't have... She just sort of came at me. And next thing, she's crying all over me. I didn't know what to do. And then what does Ron say? Don't blame, Don't blame me, mate. mate. <laughs> Usually, if, some, if someone comes at you, you probably need a towel. <laughs> I, I'm like, I'm not even like an unempathetic person, but when someone comes at me crying when I wasn't expecting it, I do like freeze like this. I'm like, oh my God, I <laughs> couldn't possibly, I am not, I wasn't, I don't have my equipment. I mean, I just think it's funny that Hermione's basically like, she's probably feeling real confused right now, but she does still like you. And Harry's like, did I do something untoward with this woman? Was I wrong? <laughs> <laughs> you were nice He's to so her. So passive, dude. You were nice to her, weren't you? Well, I, 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 I sort, I, I patted her I on, the her on the back. <laughs> no, okay. So listen, listen. The, okay, so I meant to say this earlier when we were talking about something else, but like that, Hermione talking to Harry in this scene is me trying to explain things to my husband, Sean. Like straight up, it's like, it's like you can't do this because like people will perceive this and he's like what why would they perceive that and i'm like it's not it doesn't matter why really the fact of the matter is that they do and he's like well what on earth am i supposed to do with this information it's like oh (laughs) man come on like i feel like i i really relate to hermione so deeply in this scene it's like why don't you just like talk about it or like take any action it's just i I do feel a little bit bad for Harry because I'm imagining based on his description and because we got a blackout cut, it's like Cho is like, oh, there's mistletoe. And she's like getting closer and Harry freezes and then he's like, you got to help her. And so he just kind of like she's coming in for a kiss and he just like pats her on the shoulder. No, no. And then Cho's got to do a take two, like a full take two. Uh, okay everything's so awkward this is the cringiest shit. It's, but it, it, it's it's so quintessentially 15 year old teenagers trying to i was slicker than this at 15 i don't give a shit dude. I, was like, I was not i was not i was not i was absolutely not oh my god i was this well, exact sorry. level of sorry slick. to be laughing at you I rem- when I was 15, you know what I tried to do? Because I thought it looked realistic enough. I tried to do a full-on Spider-Man kiss with my boyfriend at the time. That shit does not work. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't feel as good as it looks. I was hanging off a playground equipment and a church. <laughs> was that that's a church it. playground that's, trying to Spider-Man so kiss? Right if for some godforsaken reason there are young people listening to this. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> It gets better. It just gets so much better. You, it's practice. <laughs> yeah, eventually you're married and you're like, I know so much about the way this person kisses that nothing is exciting anymore. <laughs> I don't agree with that. <laughs> Nor but do I. I will say that if you kiss enough people, you will occasionally have in the back of your head. Remember how that person was <laughs> in oh, the for midst. Sure. For sure. Just on occasion. So they all go to bed eventually, and Harry's like this death anxiety spiral of like, should I ask her out? Like, what's happening to me? What's happening to my body? Which is super valid. I totally relate to that. I have had that happen a <laughs> number of times. That's so, so real. And then he starts dreaming about her, about his little Cho. And it's the most perfect dream. 
This is what it's, an actual dream is. Yeah, this, like, this is, is I, I didn't even write it down. She like comes out and she's like, you were supposed to, she's like, the only reason I'm here is because you promised me a hundred chocolate frog cards. Fifty chocolate frog cards. So she's mm, throwing oh, chocolate right. frog cards and she's like, at him. Cedric used to give me all kinds of chocolate <laughs> frog cards and she's like pulling them out of her pockets. And then she, and turns, then she like, turns into Hermione who says, you did promise her, you know, you you think you should give her something else. Maybe your fireball. And Harry's like, wait, Umbridge has that. I don't have that. Oh and the, yeah, and, why didn't I write any of this down? And then he you know, he don't, the any the whole thing was ridiculous. He'd only come to the DA room to put up some Christmas baubles shaped like Dobby's head. Oh, Dobby, those would be way cuter than the ones shaped like Harry. So cute with his little nose in his ears. Yeah, he is having the epitome of a first kiss dress dream. Very cute and it's sweet. So okay. yeah, but dun dun dun. And then he's a changes. snake. The dream changed. He's a dot dot snake. dot. Snake. I'm a snake. He's one hundred percent a snake. Like he's not dreaming. He's not, he's not doing anything. He's just a snake. I'm a slither the snake a snake. And he's in like the corridor. You know the one. The fucking corridor that he keeps dreaming about. Sorry, sorry, I'm yelling. I'm just kind of sick of hearing about it. It must be important, but I don't know what it is. Hmm. We don't know what it is. Oh, no. Well, and then he's like, oh, there's someone sleeping. And it's like, surprise, bitch, I'm not sleeping. And then he's like, cool, I'm going to munch on your rib cage. You're making it sound adorable. Harry longed to bite <laughs> the like, man. It's like, bite! Bite, 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 bite. Snakes are so spooky. Dude, have you ever gotten bit by a snake? I have not been bitten by a snake, but I have been rattled at by a rat, like a rattlesnake, like coiled up on me. I had to back away real slow. Oh, okay. That's have scary. you been bitten a by a one. snake? No, absolutely not. Absolutely Matt? not. No, never. No, I've never gotten close enough to a snake for that to happen to me. I've seen two. I've seen a lot of snakes in my life, but the two rattlesnakes stick out the most. Uh, one, I was on a trail alone, so fuck that. Yeah. I had to get away real fast and real slow at the same time, so I didn't spook it. The second time I was on a trail, there was a rattlesnake. I was like, okay, we're just gonna have to cut it real wide, bush push a little bit. Not a big deal. There was a group of three elder teens, like 19-year-olds, with a GoPro on it, a selfie stick extension that were sticking it in the rattlesnake's face because the rattlesnake was rattling at them and one of the dudes thought it was cool and I will never, never, till the day I die, forget the sound of his hiking partner's voice is this like 19-year-old girl that was just going, Antonio, no, Antonio, don't do that. Antonio, don't mess with the snake. Oh my God. <laughs> Antonio, no! <laughs> so, Antonio, no! Oh Antonio God, did! Get away from the snake! <laughs> there was literally that exact thing while he was just waddling closer to it with a <laughs> GoPro on an extension. I um, grew up in the woods, so I've seen a lot of like tiny garden snakes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like nothing scary. I we had some actually here in Richmond. We had like a piece of plywood. Yep. Out behind our townhouse, and when we lifted it up, there was a family of snakes underneath it, little bl- black garden snakes. They're yeah. cute. Anyway, the snake's not cute, and it murders Arthur Weasley. <laughs> yep, he's dead. He's dead. Didn't she say that was some... She had considered killing Arthur here? Yeah. Am I cr- remembering she it correctly? She consider killing Arthur. I think she should have. It would have been a bold choice. It would have... <laughs> Wait, Be bold. Really? Kill someone. Be bold. Yeah, this Make a bold with choice. You. I don't know if it was at this moment, but she definitely considered killing him at some moment. I could see killing him at some moment just because of the way that the bonds of family work in this novel. Parents gotta die, you know what I mean? <sighs> but like, wow, that would be sad. It would. I think. I feel like what I read, well, part of it was, you know, she's talked about the personal mental health problems she went through during this time. But I think she said basically that she considered killing Arthur here. But when she eventually decided not to, that's why one of the twins had to die in the Battle of Hogwarts at the end of the seventh book. She's like, Do one I of the know, Weasleys has to die. Don't kill him with a snake. <laughs> she's, like, she's like, there's nine so of these bad guys, one of them has to die. <laughs> okay, listen, a lot of things happen really quickly. Ron wakes Harry up out of this like horrific nightmare. Everyone's looking at him. He's all cold. His scar hurts like you have a horrific fever and it woke you up in the night. 
And he rolls he over and up vomits. over the side of the bed. Yep. He rolls over and vomits, yeah. And, okay, so listen. Bear with me. Nobody at any point vanishes the barf d- uh, uh, that we see. <laughs> I'm sure McGonagall does it once she gets there, but I'm just like... I would immediately you, vanish the barf. <laughs> you should get rid of this immediately. I do like that the, the first... Someone has the brain cell and says, let's go get an adult. Yeah, like, let's get an adult. It's Neville. Neville has the brain cell. Neville, Neville has the Robert brain cell. Was. And he brings back McGonagall, not Pomfrey. And, and Harry notes that. Harry's like, thank fucking God, McGonagall will take me seriously. And she, like, totally does, which yeah. is, like, really cool for him. Yeah. If I was having literally any trouble whatsoever at any time, I would want to see McGonagall pretty much. Yep. You know what I mean? So do you think as, you know, because McGonagall's the head of house, does that mean her, her, you know, her living quarters are close to, I think her living quarters would be close to the Gryffindor common room, wouldn't they? You if she's needed in the middle of the night. Sure. Yeah, that's, I don't know. It's certainly never discussed. You know, there's so much stupid stuff in this series that doesn't make sense. Yeah. The layout of the map's not clear. It always seems like class is far away from the common room and like her office, her apartment slash office would probably be near her classroom, right? I don't know, man. I don't know how private school works. Well, because it's, I don't know. Yeah, well, it's like, you know, how, you know, you, she has her office, which is probably connected to her classroom. But, but that doesn't necessarily mean her living quarters. I would think her, and that's part. You know, the Gryffindor common room is what? It's on the seventh. It's on the seventh floor or something. Or it's it's I on don't a. Know, it's up in the tower. It's in a tower. So it's 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 a tower. That's why it's really far away from everything. So I would think you know, I would think you know, regardless of head or house, you need to have an adult relatively close by. Honestly, I would say it has to be the head of house close by because, like, you wouldn't want Snape to be near, like, the Gryffindor Tower. He's not going to help anything. Mm-mm. He probably isn't even allowed in here, maybe. You know what I mean? I would say that, yeah, probably the heads of houses are only allowed in. To that Can house. you imagine if Harry if Harry was a Slytherin and he had to go get his head of house to help him after this nightmare and he has to go get Snape? Like, I just love picturing that for a time. It's just like, yeah. Like, if the sorting hat had gone the opposite direction. Yeah. Honestly, the creepiest part about that is that he would wake up Snape and Snape would be like, for a moment, I thought it was her because of your eyes. And then I saw the rest of you. So. Awful. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, he's like, I had this dream. Arthur Weasley's been hurt really badly. And McConnell's like, I believe you. Let's go uh, see Dumbledore. Which is absolutely the correct response. And again, this is yeah. why it's so important that it was McGonagall who came. Yeah. I don't think you could have called anyone else. Maybe Flitwick. No. Like, why would you do that? No. Yeah. <laughs> I and I think part of it too is we know that there's a you know there's a, a a solid relationship between McGonagall and Dumbledore. So I bet Dumbledore because we find that you know Dumbledore has had his suspicions about this shit happening to Harry you know ever since Voldemort came back. So I bet Dumbledore right. warned McGonagall that you know if Harry says he's having weird dreams about stuff you know happening. And McGonagall would have known the the schedule of who's 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 guarding the Department of Mysteries as well. So she, she would have known. Is like, oh, he was on guard duty. This is probably this definitely would check out. Well, that's the end of the chapter. Uh, Brooke, did you have any final words or like last thoughts before we get on out of here? Literally none. I've exhausted every thought in my brain. We've been recording a long time. That's crazy. Well, then you'll it's hate to hear. I, I have I have one more thing that I in my notes. Come on. Lay it on me. This dream, I think this dream is when Dumbledore first begins to suspect that Harry is a Horcrux. Because the dream is through Nagini's eyes, and when that's why when Dum- you know, Harry explains the dream to him in the next chapter, and it's just, you know, where what was your perspective for the dream? I think that's when Dumbledore begins to first suspect that it's right here, it's this dream. Mm, okay. Mm, I could I see that. It. That makes a lot yeah. of sense. That does make a lot of sense. Cool. Well, very cool chapter, y'all. I I had a great time talking about it. I can't believe we talked this long, but I like the the good parts of this book are finally happening only halfway in. <laughs> and by the good parts, you mean something is happening. Just yeah. a short <laughs> four hundred and sixty pages by my book. <sighs> uh, at the end of the chapter, uh, my end of the chapter yeah. is page four eleven. No, that can't be right. Yours is wrong, Matt. Well, I have a different <laughs> version. I have a different version. I've been tracking it carefully. I we're talking about the 870 page version. Yeah, anyway, it's time to move on to plugs. I can't. I actually can't talk about how far we are through this book. It gives me anxiety. <laughs> I can't believe we have to talk about it so much more. 
No, no, no. I'm good. I'm good. I'm cool. We have a lot of guests lined up. It's going to be amazing. Okay, so here's a fun thing. Just a little sneak peek and slash flashback. Last week on the podcast, Mike Hardison, my dear friend from Wilding Press. This week on the podcast, our friend Matt. Hello, Matt. Next week on the podcast, our friend Michael Boothby. Next week on the podcast, after that, Mott's. It's so a it's, it's a it's one syllable M. Michael M name, Matt friend. Michael Mott's. Yeah, exactly. Isn't that funny? That's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah, and it's fun. Those are some of my like funniest friends. So I'm just like really excited. It's <laughs> January is a good month. I'm only funny in this episode because of my fun dance. <laughs> <laughs> and the listeners will never know unless. Well, I am gonna put. You're gonna. You said you're gonna post a video. Yeah, like some clips. Must. Yeah, I'm gonna. Matt, do you want people to find you on the internet? <laughs> <laughs> He's still dancing. He's still raving. Uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Shaman Nomo. By the time this comes out, I'll probably see some fun pictures. I'm going to New York in a couple weeks, and then I'll be in Vegas um, next month. So check out fun pictures from those trips. That's so exciting. I love seeing all the fun places my friends go. And what, Matt, is something that you've been watching or reading or listening to or otherwise experiencing lately that you think the listeners of our podcast would enjoy? Yeah, um, you should all check out. Um, they just released it over Christmas. Matilda the Musical was done as a film and it's up on Netflix now. Oh, yeah. And, and it that is, is Emma Thompson, right? Emma Thompson is Trunchbull. And it's it's just the it's such a delightful musical. And they they've done such a great job of adapting it to be a film, and it's 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 a delight. Oh, that's awesome! Thanks so much for your recommendation, Brooke. Where can people find you on the internet? You can find me on Instagram at Passion Four Parks. You can find me on Twitter at Grumpy Brooke. I would love to plug the White Lotus. If you haven't watched the White Lotus yet, that shit is nuts and very very engrossing. So highly recommend. Awesome. I, everyone's been recommending that lately, so it I just, guess I should watch it. It literally just won a bunch of Golden Globes. Cool, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I it's one of that. the few times that Jennifer Coolidge gets to be a main character, and she's awesome. I love that for her. We yeah. stand Jennifer Coolidge, obviously. Cool, hell yeah. It, did, what, did the third season just come out, or was it the second season? Third season just released. Nice. Okay, cool. I've been your host, Christina. You know where to find me. And today I'm going back to my list of, do you remember that for like two straight months, I've been plugging every podcast I enjoy, which is like very many. Um, so today I'm going to plug just like my general comedy podcast that I enjoy that like don't really fit in any other category. First one, Harry Potter and the Boys. We've had the host of that show, um, Radio Mike, on the restricted section before. And it's like, the fan, the Harry Potter fanfic he wrote when he was in seventh grade. And it's like extremely raunchy and ridiculous. It's quite fun. I laugh a lot. The next one is Hey Riddle Riddle, which is like a, a riddle podcast. I love I love it a lot. Adel's been on the show. I think you guys probably know about it. And then the last one in this category is Sitcom D&D, which is one of the hosts from Hey Riddle Riddle, Aaron Keefe. Um, and it's it's just what it sounds like. It's like D&D. It's like D&D light, you know, like real play. But it's like sitcom-y and it's quite a fun plot line. It, it's quite good. So those are the comedy podcasts that I recommend. Matt, thank you so much for joining us today on the Restricted section. We talk. I, I feel like I talk to you all the time about Harry Potter shit, but it's nice to get you on the show so that you can preach to the masses. Yeah, let me spew my nonsense to a wide audience. Hell yeah, that's what we do here. Brooke, as always, thank you so much for being my co-conspirator on this one. No worries. Happy to be here to, again, discuss some real wet kissing. Wet kisses. <laughs> Go find the person you love and give them a real wet kiss. Pat them on the back first. Pat them on the no back explanation. <laughs> Walk up, gentle back pat, immediate kiss. <laughs> And then email us or stick section pod at gmail.com. Let me know how that goes for you. That's the <laughs> end of the episode. Da, 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 da. That's it, Podheads. Thanks for listening to the Restricted Section. This podcast is produced and hosted by me, Christina Kahn. Our theme music was produced by Ryan Kahn. Our logo was designed by Michael Hardison. Please connect with us on Twitter at RestrictedPod on Instagram at Restricted Section Pod, on Facebook at Restricted Section Pod, or in our Facebook group, The Restricted Section Detention Crew. Join our Patreon to get access to our Discord server, our bonus episodes, and other cool perks. 
We're also very happy to be a member of Deus Ex Media, where all you fucking nerds can find all kinds of fandom podcasts to suit your fancy. Coffee. Tea. Honor. Cabbage. Long ago, the four elements lived in harmony. Then, shit went totally cray when the Avatar attacked. Only the Cabbage Man, merchant of fine cruciferous vegetables, could stand against his trolling. But when the world needed some dank veg, he vanished. Ten years have passed, and my partner and I have started a new podcast. My Cabbage is An Avatar podcast. A weekly show about Avatar The Last Airbender. Whether it's Sokka's new line of cologne. Hey, look at you. Sitting there on a seal. Well, now look at back at me. I'm on a, on a b- even bigger seal. Now look away. D and D related antics. You have to make an acrobatics check for that. And Ang just like unzips his pants and whips out his d20s. He's just like, I got this. A randomly breaking into song. <laughs> so go bending waterfall. We'll stumble our way through the greatest show ever made, one episode at a time. What kind of slum do you think this is? I'm a snag. I'm a snag. I'm a snag. I'm a slither little snake snag. I'm so slither and sneaky because I'm a snag. Dave X Media.